Welcome to Real Food Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America. This episode is made possible by our friends at the University of Tennessee at Martin. UT Martin offers more than 100 academic areas of study within 18 undergraduate degree programs. Contact UT Martin today to find a program that's right for you. Welcome, everybody, to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Emma, before I introduce our very special guest, what is something you have discovered recently at Discovery Park of America? Well, Scott, this week I discovered that there is a real meteorite on display in the Science, Space, and Technology Gallery. This iron nickel meteorite fell to earth in China in 1516 and weighs 661 pounds. And you know, the thing I find fascinating about that meteorite is at Discovery Park of America, Robert Kirkland really wanted everyone to be able to touch things. He didn't want to have any typical behind the glass kind of thing. So the meteorite is a great example of things people can actually touch here at Discovery Park that other places there might be a rope in front of it. So very nice. Well, my special guest today is Emmy Award winning writer, producer, and director, Henry Giles. Welcome. Welcome, Henry. Thank you. Happy to be here. Um, so before we talk about all the cool things you've done with your career, um, I want to hear a little bit about where you're from, where did you grow up, and uh, what was your path to, to that Emmy? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I grew up in West Tennessee. I'm a fellow West Tennessean. I grew up in Haywood County in a tiny town uh, named Stanton, which If you've traveled I-40, you've seen it. Hope you didn't blink because you probably missed it. But it's um, it's a a small rural area um, between Jackson and Memphis. And that's where I grew up. I grew up with, um, you know, my my family, my parents, my uh, two brothers and five sisters. So I come from a from a big family. And um, many of us actually attended UT Martin. And I, wanting to be like my big brothers and, and, and sisters, I sort of followed in their path. And so I, I came to UT Martin as well for my undergrad. And um, from there, I started working in the industry pretty early. I was able to get an internship at one of the television stations in Nashville. And I worked there for a while. And then I moved to Charlotte. And I worked there for a while and came back to Nashville. And I worked for a number of different um, media companies. And then I decided, okay, I think I'll go out on my own. And so I was a freelance producer for many years. And um, that opened up the door for me to work at a lot of different places on a freelance basis, of course. Um, But it it made my career so that no two days were the same because I would get a call from one company to cover a story. And then the next day I'd get a call from another company and I'm, you know, off doing something else. So um, I was not home a whole lot. I I traveled quite a bit and I enjoyed that. And uh, so I was able to, to work on a lot of different programs and meet a lot of a lot of different people and really hone my skills as a storyteller. That's what I like to, how I like to describe myself as a storyteller. I love meeting people and hearing about their journeys and then um, telling other people about their journeys. It's funny that you say that because I had written on my notes for this um, episode where I described you, I actually wrote storyteller out out to the side. Yeah. So, um, so we're jiving on the same page. We Um, are. We are. So young folks who are listening, you know, they're going to, they'll see in the notes when we describe the episode that you've got Emmys and that you've worked with Oprah and, and Alfre Woodard, and you've had an incredible career. Where did you, when you first reached out 
you know, to the first internships or the first, the very first gigs, I'm assuming you didn't start off in the director's chair. Oh, no. Oh, no. I, I started out, you know, as, as the, the lowly intern um, who just asked a lot of questions. And I actually found some people who were willing to help me, um, you know, help me learn how to edit help me learn how to uh, hone my writing skills. So I, I preach this to my students now about the importance of internships because that's really what started me on my path. And I tell my students, do such a good job at your internship where they'll miss you. I'll tell them, you know, make, make them miss you so that when you leave, they will want you to come back in some capacity. And uh, that was what happened with with me when I was when I was in Nashville and working at um, that television station. I learned so much, and I was able to to leave there knowing how to do a lot of things. And so I was able to take those skills to um, another place, and then another place, and 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 so so on. But you know, being dependable. Um, never let people see you sitting, doing nothing, you know, just sitting idly by. You don't want that. You want to always be busy, not just appear busy, but be busy and always asking, is there something I can help you with? Um, is there anything else I can do? So these are the things I tell my students now. Um, that's how you not only get your foot in the door, but get in the door and, and start making, um, making a path for yourself. Yeah. I think that cannot be overstated. Um, as a person who hired, who hires people, um, it always blows me away when somebody says, Hey, I've got that done. Uh, what else can I do? You yes. know, love yes. those kind of people. Yes. And, and you actually have one, one of those folks who's, who's on, on this program with us, Emma. Emma <laughs> is my former student. I'm so proud of her. She's incredible. I'm telling you, you did a good job. You and everybody else who poured Aww. into her. I am, yeah. I, I am, as somebody who gets to be in the office next to her, I'm very grateful uh, for Emma, for sure. Yes. Um, so another point about that that popped in my head when you were saying that is the other day I asked how many of our senior leaders here at Discovery Park started off as interns and they sent me the spreadsheet back and I would say more than half of the folks mm -hmm. who are working here now began their careers here as interns. So you're right. Internships cannot be more uh, important. Right. right. Um, I know at some point along the way you um, wrote, produced and directed reflect, reclaim, rejoice, preserving the gift of black sacred music. Um, what um, was the idea for that? The idea behind that documentary actually did not start off as a documentary. Uh, I was hired by the United Methodist Church to produce a video that looked at black sacred music. And I'll, 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 I was approached to put together something that was almost like a tutorial that the United Methodist Church wanted to make available to their other congregations because many felt as if this type of music was being lost, that different congregations did not want to sing this kind of music anymore because this is music that has been passed on for generations. It's, you know, 400 years old. And so they approached me to do this video to more or less encourage people to want to sing this music. And the more research that I did and the more people that I talked to, I went back to, um, I went back to the folks at, um, at the United Methodist Church and said, I think this is a little bigger than what we originally thought. And I shared with them some of the information that I had gathered. And so even though they had come to me about doing this project, I 
sort of pitched my idea to them and said, how about if we do a documentary? Because I, I feel like uh, that would be a better format for the story that you want to tell. And so they were on board with that. And I worked on, on this project for, I guess, maybe close to two years between the time that I started doing the research, pulling together the interviews. And we went to South Carolina, um, we went to Georgia, we went to Maryland, um, went to Nashville. And I, I talked to so many different people and it turned into one of the most beautiful projects I think I've ever worked on. The music was wonderful. I got to meet so many people who, you know, the, the, this music meant so much to them and, and it still means so much to them. And so I was able to tell this story about black sacred music and how it came to this country and how it is really the foundation for all other music genres that we enjoy here. And, um, so it, it was an incredible experience. And of course, with that project, we had the opportunity of bringing on Alfrey Woodard as the narrator. And that was pretty spectacular. Yeah. Well, and I think um, part, part of it that was so powerful were when the women and the men would sing a cappella and just sing some of the historic uh, sounds, things that we don't really hear anymore in church. Right, so. right. Uh, different, uh, different hymns, different Negro spirituals, um, the ring shout. I learned a lot myself working on this as I was doing the research because I was not even familiar with this type of music called the ring shout. Um, it's called, um, you know, something else that, that I was more familiar with, sort of the, the, the call and response. But um, the, the ring shout is another form of, of worship that, you know, people still do that now. The other fascinating thing about this project is uh, even though we went to different parts of the country, it was so interesting to see how similar uh, people handled the music. Because when we were in, um, when we were in Delaware, I believe, it, I, I just sat there in awe listening to that church group sing because it reminded me so much of the church that I grew up in, in Stanton. So, um, and I thought, wow, how, how did this music get to be preserved? And even though it traveled all across the country, the, the, the music went with the people as, as, as people moved about, um, as, uh, people who were enslaved as they were were bought and sold and moved to different places, that music went with them. And so we see that now, even with, with churches that still do sing this type of music. And it's, it's rather extraordinary when you think about it, um, how that music was developed and how it's still here. Well, and the gentleman who said that, he felt like sometimes the universities were doing more to preserve that style of music than some of the churches mm -hmm. who switched over to a more contemporary, you know, style of singing. I yes. thought that was really interesting. Yes, that was Reverend Joseph Lowry. And um, I had, I, I was so glad that he was a part of this because he, of course, is a civil rights, was a civil rights icon. And uh, this music was so instrumental to the civil rights movement. And so I was so happy that he was, was able to be a part of this. Is project. that where you met him to start working with him on a book? No, actually um, I had worked with him on the book before then. Okay. Um, I was having a conversation with someone who, who was saying, oh, you know, we, we'd love to get Reverend Lowry uh, to work on a book. And, and I thought, oh, really, I, I, can, I can talk to him and, and see, because I, I had um, worked with him on some other projects before. And so I called him. And of course, he really didn't feel as if he had anything to say. And it's like, really? So mm -hmm. uh, after a, a little, little talking with him, and I think his, 
his daughters also helped convince him. He agreed to do the book. And so that was another highlight in my career, being able to work with him in pulling together some of his older sermons and um, putting them in a book form and having him talk about um, some of the early years of the civil rights movement and how that work influenced other events um, in our country. What were some of the differences between working on a, the production of a book project versus a documentary? Oh, wow. Um, with both projects, there's a lot of research. When I was working with Reverend Lowry on his book, that involved a lot of phone calls, that involved a lot of emails. Um, we didn't really spend spend really any time before, uh, do, while we were working on the book, we never spent any time face to face. So it was all by phone, exchanging email. Um, he was having to go through a lot of, of boxes and folders to find some of his sermons that he wanted to share. Um, so both projects took a lot of research I think, of course, with the documentary, it was more hands-on because in addition to the research, then you have to schedule uh, the production, schedule all the shoots and, you know, dealing with people in different parts of the country, that can be a little tricky. And then, of course, going there, doing the interviews, looking through all of the footage, writing the script going into edit sessions, putting it together and, you know, different levels of approval when you're putting together a project for someone else. When they're, when there's the client, you have to make the client happy. And so if one person doesn't like it, um, the other person there might like it. And so you have to try to figure out a way to, to smooth that out. But, but they both um, require a lot of research, but I think with the documentary, it was definitely more, more hands-on. So for someone who is um, interested in creating a documentary, for me personally, I would rather watch a documentary than any other kind of movie. That's what I, I yeah. For. yeah, I love me documentaries. Too. So what's the process that someone like you goes through from the idea to the finished product and I know it's different for every project, but roughly, how does it go from your head to the TV? Okay. Fortunately, the the films that I've worked on, I have been contracted by other companies. Um, in the case with the Black Sacred Music film, it was the United Methodist Church. I also worked on a documentary that um, focuses on African-Americans and country music. And that documentary was for CMT. So it aired on CMT several years ago. And I, when I look at that film now, I'm amazed because it could air today and really not lose anything. And um, so I've, I've been able to work with other companies in, in producing these because that's the other thing, being an independent producer, either you were contracted by someone else or you, you self-fund the project. So you pay for it yourself. Um, fortunately, I've been able to work with people and talk to them and, uh, you know, we both have a, a shared interest in the topic. When I worked on the documentary for CMT, this was something that CMT had never done. They had never focused on the African-American perspective of, as it relates to country music. And for a lot of people, this was pretty surprising and groundbreaking because a lot of people were not aware of the many connections, of the many influences. Some of the, the top country performers had African-American influences in, in their lives, um, in their careers, and even some of the instruments that are synonymous 
with country music today, a lot of those instruments were um, were from Africa. So um, this was information that a lot of people, um, they just were not aware about. And so they, they weren't aware of this information. And so my, uh, my partner at the time, we went in and, um, and talked to CMT and, and the two of us were able to talk to CMT and say, you know, this is a story that's worth telling. And they agreed. And so we were able to, to put together this documentary that aired on CMT. What, what, when did it air? That was, I think it was 2005. So it's, right. it's been a while. It doesn't seem like it's been that long. I think 2005, 2006. Yeah. When it's packed with celebrity, you know, entertainment uh, people, who, who handles all the clearances and arranging for, I mean, that's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. Fortunately, with, with CMT, uh, they, had, uh, they, they had staff there who that's all they dealt with. So we would talk to them about the different clips, the different historic, historical clips that we found. And, you know, they would look up all of that information and say, OK, uh, we can't use that. We can't use that clip. Or they they would say you can use that, but you can only use fifteen seconds of it because that's going to cost X number of dollars if you want to to play more of it. That's going to eat into the overall budget. So fortunately, CMT they had very um, you know capable people right there um, on the staff who who helped us with that. Yeah, no, that's that's very helpful because I know that's a lot of paperwork. A lot of paperwork. Yes. Yeah. So a lot of conversations um, with with people who, you know, that that's what they do. You know, but but they handled all of that for us. So Luke here, who is um our production king on uh these podcasts, is also an incredible videographer who I oh, know wow. has multiple documentaries in his head. What's your advice to young documentarians? What what's something you've picked up along the way that you oh, all gosh. pass along? Get, get get them out of your head. <laughs> get them <laughs> out of your head. Um but but seriously, if if you do have have some ideas start talking to people. Um, if you are able to, if, if you are a videographer and you're able to shoot your own footage and edit, that's, that's huge. That's great. And so if you're able to do that, and, and, and now you look at technology and how much technology has changed. I mean, when I first started, I mean, we were still, we were shooting on tape. And, um, you know, editing on tape. And now everyone has a cell phone. You can shoot incredible footage even with a cell phone. So technology has opened the, the door for a lot of people to explore that creative side. So I, I, would, I would look at the, the idea that you have and maybe try to find some entities that might be interested in partnering with you. But if you're able to do the production yourself, I would start talking to the people connected to that idea. Who are the people you're going to interview? Who can help you tell the story? Um, how are you going to tell the story? Will it be you know, non-narrative? Will you let the subjects tell the story? And if you do that, then you know, there are some things that you certainly need to be aware of as you are producing the piece. But there are so many great stories out there to be told. And I, I would just start thinking of who, who are the people I, I would want to talk to? Who are the people who can best help explain this story? Um, who are some experts who I could talk to if, if that's applicable? Um, and then just start start looking at, at what you have and and, if, if you need to write to it, or as I said, if it's non-narrative, just start start putting it together. And, and again, there, there are so many platforms now where you can show your work, where you can, you know, get your work in, in, in front of people. Um, so 
I think technology has certainly helped take away some of the barriers that used to be there for, for people who are creatives. I wonder if, if it had, do you feel like it has in any way um, messed with the quality of the work that is produced because in the olden days we <laughs> used to, whenever there was something that was going to go from happening into film, yes. it was purposeful. Yes. And now, you know, now you can hold up your phone and do a TikTok in, in 30 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. You can record the cat walking across the room and <laughs> it gets 5 million hits. I know <laughs> that's one of my, yeah, that that's one of my my areas of of contention a little bit because I am very concerned with the quality, and um, now, like you were saying, <laughs> you know, you can pretty much post anything, and I think sometimes that gets lost. I think, you know, just because you have an idea and just because you have the equipment, um, I think you have to think about the execution and you do have to think about the quality. And I think, think a lot of times that gets lost. Even now when I watch things, even on, you know, on some networks and the way things are edited now with, with the jump cuts and how I'm thinking who let that, who said yes to that, but it's, um, it's, it's so common now. And I think with the ease of being able to produce something, I think people take shortcuts and they try to pass it off as art. Um, it's, it's not art. Some of it is just a hot mess, but it's... Uh, <laughs> well, Luke, Luke is um, really good at, at uh, quality, right, Luke? Hey, uh, Henry, to like touch on what you were mm-hmm. saying there. Of, you know, I've always uh, thought the a- actual idea of perfection is not adding until you have all the, the perfect notes, but taking away until, mm-hmm. you know, the point in which you're taking away, you're actually diminishing on the quality mm-hmm. of it. Also, I've also said to, you know, you can pass any city and see like a thousand people in the city and you can say, you know, there's probably a hundred award winning ideas out there, mm-hmm. but it is, the execution is what actually separates everything. Yes, the execution. You're absolutely right. So we're going to take a real quick little break. And when we get back, I'm going to ask you about Oprah. Hundreds of students experience real world learning at UT Martin. Faculty members pair students with the perfect internship, clinical or educational placement that best suits their area of study. Visit utm.edu to learn more about UT Martin. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or your podcast catcher of choice. It helps more people learn about all the cool people here in West Tennessee. Our guest today is Henry Giles, and we've been talking all about uh, uh, documentaries and production and all kinds of cool stuff. And now, I'm going to ask her a little bit about um, the Oprah Winfrey show. Um, my wife, years ago, we were watching one of those behind the scene Oprah Winfrey episodes where they showed all the production people and the staff and they were working on a project. And my wife said, man, I, that's my dream. I would love to work on the Oprah Winfrey show. And so you're somebody who, who you've worked on some segments. What, what did you do for the Oprah Winfrey show? I was a freelance field producer for the Oprah Winfrey show, meaning I was based in Nashville, but they would call me to go on different shoots in different parts of the country. Um, I remember once, and and I did, I traveled a lot with them. Uh, I had just gotten back. I had just returned to Nashville from a shoot. And this is the truth. I had not even taken my bags out of the car yet. And they called again and said, oh, we need you to go to, you know, someplace else. And I said, oh, I just walked in the door. And so I came in, made a few changes, hopped back, went back to the airport. So uh, as a freelance producer, that's kind of how your life goes. And for, you know, working with the Oprah Winfrey show was, of course, a highlight. And I was talking to someone about this just a few days ago 
saying, yes, of course, it, it was a highlight being associated with that show. But for me, as a Black producer, being able to be associated with not only a show, but a company that was owned by or is owned by a Black woman, that meant, I think, a little bit more to me. The, the few times that I did work out of the Chicago office, I can't tell you the pride that I had whenever I'd walk into that building. Um, it was more than just, oh, this is the Oprah Winfrey show. It was almost like having some connection to this extraordinary piece of, of history, of media history. And so that meant so much more to me than uh, just the, the surface of, oh, this is the Oprah Winfrey show. But I enjoyed working with them so much. Uh, a lot of the stories that I did, I will never forget. Um, one story that I worked on was in South Carolina. I went there to interview a, um, a man who had recently lost his wife. And that whole show, the whole show was about um, people who had killed someone accidentally. And even though it, it, it sounds, you know, pretty heavy and, and, and it was, but there were some redeeming factors to, to that show. So the person that I interviewed was this husband who had accidentally killed his wife um, by leaving the car running after he boosted his car. Um, he backed out of the garage and without turning off his wife's car, let the garage door down and went on to work. And so mm. you can imagine what happened. And so it was one of, it was, it was probably one of the most, it was probably the most painful interview I have ever done because I had to take him back to that moment, you know, to tell that story. So I felt bad about having to have him relive that pain, but his story was so incredible and I, I will never, never forget it. But working on that show put me in positions where I got to talk to a lot of interesting people. I got to be a part of, of some of the big surprises. You know, the Oprah show was famous for the surprises. And did you get, did you get a car? I did not get a car, <laughs> darn it. But, uh, <laughs> but I was, I was in Houston. This was after Katrina. And I was, I, I also interviewed some people as Katrina was happening. They sent me to one of the, um, one of the, the the shelters where people from New Orleans were being sent. And so talking to people who were at their lowest, they had lost and lost everything. And when I say everything, not only their homes, but family members. And a few weeks later or a few months later, I got a call to go to Houston and it was top, top secret. And the people who were there in the audience, I think it was a, a school or some sort of facility, a gym. And these people were gathered there thinking that they were going to fill out insurance information related to Katrina. And so they had the person on stage sort of talking to them. And then out from the curtain walks Oprah. And so you can imagine the, the response for that. And so, of course, people lost their minds. But then what they didn't know was that everyone in that room was getting a home. Wow. Yes. That's intense. Yeah. So you go from covering the first part of that story when it was happening, talking to people when they had lost everything and they were at their lowest to a few months later watching them receive this wonderful gift of a home. So it, 
it was, of course, emotional, emotional for all of us who, who, who were there working on it. So um, I, 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 had, I had a lot of fun working on those stories, working on, on those different segments. Did you do any of the road trip, the Oprah and Gail road trips? I did a little of that. And um, to, to sort of give you a peek into how that whole show was produced, um, I was not on the part of um, the production with Oprah and Gail. I came in afterwards. And so some of the places that they stopped, um, one of the places was Memphis. And so I went to Memphis afterwards to get the um, uh, to get the, the the beauty shots, so to speak. So you had a crew who was there with them, following them as they you know got into Memphis and went to Graceland and and all of these other places. So all of the places that they went, um, I uh, I was working on uh, I was working with with the production crew who went after them. Who got okay. the shots of Graceland? Who, you know, every place that they went, we we got the shots so you could edit all of that together. Because I was working at Graceland when they came. You're kidding! Yes, I thought that might be funny if you and I even worked together. You know, didn't, we didn't may, realize it. <laughs> right? We we could have. Wow, yeah, that's so something. That- yeah, that was uh, that was a lot of fun. You know, everybody at Graceland gets all types of visitors from all over the world, mm-hmm. but Oprah and Gail were pretty special. Yeah, to have them. yeah, that was that was a fun that was a fun shoot. That was a fun show to see them hitting different different places. Yeah, it was it was a really good episode. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about what you're doing now. You're an educator. You're giving back uh, to the people of this community. Tell us a little bit about today. Well, I am going into my sixth year at the University of Tennessee at Martin. I came here um, having not taught in a university setting before. So I was a little um, little nervous about that. But I think being able to share with students my experiences and, and, and work with them makes it so much easier and it makes it, it it definitely takes the edge off of it because now I consider myself working with the next generation of media professionals. And so everything that I've learned, I am more than happy to share it with them. Things like, you know, we were talking earlier about internships and developing good work, work skills um, and, and, and on the creative end, of course, giving them tips and information in giving them tips and information about how to tell a story. Um, what are some things that you should look for? What are some things that you should avoid? Um, you know, how do you tell a good story? I am enjoying working with, with students. I get the opportunity to help them, um, expand their creativity a little bit, um, sort of encourage them to take that step. A lot of the students have never really done interviews before or um, had to approach people about an interview. And so things like that, it's really interesting to see how they progress and how they be- how they become a little bit more comfortable. Um, but I, I also tell my students that like, like them, I'm also a student. I'm working on my PhD at the University of Memphis. And so I've, I even had a student ask me, why in the world are you getting your PhD? And I told him, I'm getting it for you. Because if I'm teaching, I want to be able to be the best. I want to be able to Um, share with you information that's going to make you better. And the way that I do that is that I have to become better. And so even though I have all of these years of experience in the field, working in production and working on a lot of different programs, now I want to look at it from an academic standpoint and look at some of the, some of the theories and some of the, um, 
some of the, the ways that different people think about media, um, some of the causes and effects of, of media. And I'm able to, to do that by you know, being in this program and hopefully sharing that information with my students as well. And what's your what what a uh, school is your PhD in? Is it? Uh, it's in the, the it's in the communication department, and it's um, rhetoric and media studies. Oh wow, that's going to be great! How far along into it are you? I am taking my final course this semester. Oh, congratulations! Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. Did you, did you have to do like a final uh, project or paper? Or? Yes, I will be working on my dissertation. Um, before I start my dissertation, I have to complete um, the comprehensive exams. And then I can um, really dive into my dissertation. Have you picked a topic out yet? I have. I am planning to look at media representation of African-Americans and how sometimes those messages can be used as a means of social control. Now, I'll, I will finesse that title, um, but, but that's pretty much the gist of it. That sounds like it might make a good book afterwards as well. I know, or a documentary. A documentary. <laughs> yes, which my, my plan was to... Um, videotape all of the people who I had wanted to to interview. And then this little thing called COVID happened mm. that sort of put the brakes on that. So now I'm trying to figure out the the best way to handle that because as we were talking about before, also about quality, I I don't want to sacrifice quality I don't want, you know, as, as, as helpful and as wonderful as Zoom is, that's helping us survive these days. I don't want to um, do everything. I don't want all of my interviews to be done via Zoom. So I'm trying to figure that out now. Yeah, hopefully we'll turn the page on this soon and we can all uh, be together. For us, when we started this podcast out, we had a rule that people had to come and be with us in our little studio we made here at Discovery Park. But mm -hmm. we've actually learned that it is really convenient for people to pop on Zoom with us and, and give us a little bit of their time. Yeah. Before we go, I would love it if you could tell us a little bit about the Weekly County Reconciliation Project. Oh, that is an organization that I have been a part of, I guess, about three years now. This is a relatively new organization. And one of our, our main goals is to create a space where people can discuss matters of race. Because, as you know, that's one of those topics that a lot of people avoid. They really don't know how to talk about it. Some people might be curious, but they hold back because they don't want to offend anyone. This is an organization that hopefully will, will make people comfortable about um, approaching the topic of race. We have held some community events in the past. And one of the things that, that we are, are working toward is um, we are trying to get the monument that's in Birmingham at the Equal Justice Initiative um, Museum and the, um, the museum that they have dedicated to lynching victims. Um, we are trying to get the monument for Weekly County, which lists the names of, of um, the people known to EJI to have been lynched here. And so in order to acquire that, you have to go through various steps. And one of the steps is, um, you know, recognizing or um, acknowledging where someone was lynched by collecting soil. And so we actually held a ceremony back in September um, for Mally Wilson, who was lynched in Greenfield in 1915. And we held a, it was very solemn. And I don't think any of us imagined how emotional it, it would be. This was our first one. 
And so we held this ceremony to commemorate his life. And a lot of people will think, why in the world are you all doing that? That happened a long time ago. What's the point? And the point is to recognize someone's humanity. That this was a person who lived, he was someone's son, he was someone's brother, and this happened to him. And I think we have to acknowledge things like that. We can't always just sweep them under the rug. And I know, you know, as, as a culture, as a society, that's what we what we tend to do. Um, but we collected the soil from the place where we believe that he was lynched in 1915. And so when things get better, we hope to, um, you know, get that soil to the Equal Justice Initiative in Birmingham. But th this is an organization that I think is what this area needs. And it's, it's, it was started by some people from Martin, but it is not a Martin organization. It is an organization for the county and surrounding areas. Um, so if anybody's listening and they're not from Weekly County, you would love for them to get involved. And how would they find out more about what's going on? They can go to our website, which is Weekly reconciliation.com or you can go to Facebook. Um, Weekly County Reconciliation Project has a page on Facebook. So either of those ways you can see what events we have going on, um, what events are upcoming. That's how you can follow and, and how you can become involved. And we'll put uh, a link over to that in the program notes. Um, as well as over to your website. I know you've got a website where you've got some clips of your work that, that folks can check out that's really cool. So we'll put a link over to that as well. Oh, okay. Thank you. And thank you for being on our podcast today. Absolutely. I enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoy this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.